What's up, y'all? We're back with another episode of the Future DDS Podcast. It's Nick, Tyler, Terrell here. Uh, and today, the topic of discussion is CEs. So, uh, you know, as a dental student, probably not too much as a pre-dent, but as a dental student, and definitely as a dentist, the topic of CEs um, is, a, is a really hot topic. All right, so questions of which CEs are good, which CEs are worth it, um, how much these CEs actually are, and if the CEs are actually worth the value that they say they are worth, you know, especially when you're paying upwards of $10,000 to take a course, you obviously want to make sure you're getting the value from it. You want to make sure that you're going to be able to translate those skills from what they say or what the course description is to your actually day-to-day practice. All right. So um, we're just going to talk about our perspective on what's the ease we think are beneficial, uh, what's the ease we think we've taken so far that are, are have been worthwhile for us and how we've been able to translate a lot of that information to our practice. And obviously, you know, um, just kind of discuss the the whole realm of the CEs and the stigma behind certain CEs or maybe destination CEs. So, um, Tyler, Nick, man, how's everything going? How y'all doing this week, man? Good, good, good. solid, great. Everything's great. I'm actually in the in the CE realm right now. I'm literally in Miami. Uh, I have a CE course tomorrow, early morning. Um, it's going to be interesting because it's extremely loud outside of my room. Of course, being in Miami, I decided to stay in downtown, whereas probably not the best decision because I literally can hear parties going on. I don't know how I'm going to sleep, but uh, <laughs> I'm excited for tomorrow. Um, and yeah, I- I'm excited. So literally, we're we're in this right now. So this is a great time for us to have this discussion for sure. Yeah, yeah. So it's, it's funny, man. I actually just got done taking a seat this weekend. Like you said, it's perfect timing. Um, just seeing like the benefits of it and actually seeing how some of these, uh, some of the information and some of these steps, or I guess some of these, um, things that you can actually implement right away versus some things that may take a little bit more time having to get patience, maybe more so versus some things you could do as like a leadership CE or, or different things in terms of the business aspect. So, um, just, you know, it, it mentioned it to diving in, diving into that, um, into, into those elements of it and hear more about obviously what CE you got going on. What CE are you actually in Miami for though? So I am doing a CE on, uh, it's pretty much the basics of occlusion. You know, I'm definitely trying to get more into uh, some FMR uh, cases. So, you know. That's full, full month reconstruction for, for everybody out there who doesn't know full oh, month reconstruction. Yeah. <laughs> yep, and definitely trying to, you know, uh, you know, get more into aesthetics, implants, things of that nature. Um, and what everybody will see or everybody will learn, especially in dental school, and even more so when you're getting out of dental school, that occlusion is everything. And there are so many different types of theories on occlusion. But what I did is um, I talked to some of my mentor dentists and I said, hey, I need a great occlusion course. Uh, where should I go? They recommended this one. And so I'm here. Um, so, yeah, I mean, this is the beginning. And this is like, I want to say my first real CE. Um, and when I say real, I mean paid for. Whereas, um, you know, and Terrell can talk on this a little bit more, uh, but, you know, when you work with these DSOs, you do go to their uh, their CE courses and they're great. Don't get me wrong. They're definitely great. But I think that now in the real world, quote unquote, where, you know, you actually have to actually pay, I think it's a little different. So I'm excited to have the experience tomorrow and we'll see how it goes. Yeah, definitely, man. So speaking of, I guess, that DSO world or, the corporate dental world um, where, you know, typically these, these larger scale uh, dental support organizations, they have their own structures, they have their own systems that they're looking to implement a lot of times just because, you know, um, it's so-called fail safe to, to increase productivity, to increase team engagement, to increase overall skill of the doc, so to speak. Right. So um, the company I work for actually has like a first year doctor track and Tyler knows, um, as well, like they're the first year doctor track where you're really learning about the essentials of not only is, is not only clinical things, because you definitely do learn a lot in terms of clinical uh, skills, but more so in terms of leadership and maybe commanding a team, being able to galvanize personalities, learn a lot about your personality style, communication styles. Um, that's actually a class that I took. One of the classes I took this past week, it was about team, you know, team communication, just kind of being a cohesive um, unit, you know, to just to provide the best patient care, right? So, you know, a lot of times people think about private practice, 
and you go to these private practices and they've been working with the same staff for maybe 20, 30 years, a lot of times, especially if it's a well-established practice, but because with so many employees in these larger organizations, you know, there's a lot of, um, I guess not even always turnover, but people have the opportunity to move locations. Like if you want to move to a new state, there's most likely an office there where you can join. Or if you want to, you know, you decide to move or, you know, you have to change up your schedule a little bit more, there's an opportunity for you to shift. So with these shifts, it's always good to just maintain um, effective communication styles, understanding, learning how to understand your team a little bit better and learning what makes you guys click the best so that you guys can be efficient throughout the day and, and obviously um, provide the best care for the patients. Um, learning how to communicate with patients, learning how to, you know, be in a leadership role and maybe disseminate information in a way, especially, you know, in my case, being younger than a lot of my staff members, being able to uh, implement some things or, or communicate some things in an effective way where they'll actually be receptive to it because you can connect with them, um, like on that professional level and kind of build that personal connection so that, you know, what you say is a little bit more effective and has some more impact. So. Um, like I said, I think I think there's a lot of different elements and a lot of aspects of CEs. Um, and, you know, like Tyler said, like, you know, I, I, I'm i interested to get more into that realm, you know, of, of looking outside um, or just more so tailor tailor making my own CE courses or, or my, my own CE curriculum, similar to what you're doing right now. And um, like you said, so I guess what sparked that that inclination to do FMR or more aesthetics like what was it is it is it more so something in terms of like cases that you've seen that inspired that is it something that you you know always wanted to do even since school or like yeah what kind of inspired that decision yeah no definitely not something that I wanted to do uh during school I think it was more so um being in the real world and just, just kind of listening to these real world problems whereas um I I think the, the number one thing that we see is patients coming in and they're in pain, right? So the first thing is, okay, I need to learn how to get my patients out of pain, whether that be extractions or whether that be root canals, right? So after I've done a couple of those, I'm feeling more and more confident. I start to think, okay, what's number two? Number two thing that patients, uh, or the number two thing that patients come in wanting to ask me about is, hey, I don't necessarily like my smile. Um, and so as a dentist, you know, when we're able to take patients out of pain, it feels amazing, but then it's like, okay, if I'm able to also make you more confident about your smile, oh, that, that is the job. That's literally what yeah. I do this for. And so I look at it as more so of me just being a complete comprehensive dentist. I think that, um, you know, aesthetics alone is cool, but, you know, I, I just want to really make sure that everybody's kind of rid of their disease and in a place to where everything is working the right way. Um, you can put veneers on teeth and not adjust their occlusion and those veneers pop off and the patient's actually in a worse situation than they were before. So um, really just doing the due diligence of um, really starting to, now that I feel more comfortable with the industry, kind of step back and look at things or look at a mouth as like a blank canvas and and think about how I can improve this patient's situation. Um, but it's, it's funny how you say, uh, Terrell, where you're talking about the communication things. I think that a lot of people don't recognize how much of a skill that uh, communication really, really is. And it's kind of like, you know, you might naturally have the gift of gab and you might think that um, yeah, I'm naturally good with people. I'll be a great dentist. But what you start to realize, especially with taking these communication courses, um, is that there are like little words, little triggers that can make or break your relationship with your patient or the actual appointment. Um, and so really kind of learning about that and the psychology of everything this is why I really enjoyed those kind of, uh, I say like social CEs, right? Sure. Whereas now being able to do these more so hands-on and actual like uh, uh, like practical, uh, almost physical type of CEs, it's going to be, um, or operative CEs, it's going to be a lot more interesting, or not even a lot more interesting, but just interesting in general to see kind of the, the difference in between the two. But you had made a really good point in regards to um, the utility of these courses, right? Because granted, everybody has told me, do not waste your money. Do not waste $15,000. Don't waste $20,000. If when you come back, you don't have patience to see in regards to reference that CE that you just took. So right. 
I mean, Terrell and I, we always talk about taking these implant CEs, but realistically, if we place these CEs in the course, then we come back to our practices and we don't have actual patients to do these procedures on. Literally, it's one of those things. If you don't use it, you'll lose it. So yeah, um, yeah. everybody considering spending a lot of money on CEs, definitely make sure that you are putting yourself in a position to where you will have the patients to actually see and reference those CEs when you get back, for sure. So I have a few questions for you guys. Um, first of all, are CEs required as part of being a dentist? Do you have to take a number of CEs per year? Yeah, so mm -hmm. in Maryland, it's 30 hours of CE every year. Um, for Georgia, I'm not exactly sure. Not sure. Where. Yeah, but it's I'm definitely sure. a, a quota every year, like in order when you're trying to get your license renewed. So you have to like basically make document, have documentation of like the CEs that you have. But typically, like um, working with like a corporate dentistry, a lot of times the CEs are built into the courses that you're, you have to take anyway. So it's not necessarily as much of a thing to to have to do or have to like think about as much. Um, even with like hygienists, hygienists have to do a certain amount of CE as well. But like some of those CEs are like HIPAA CEs or like OSHA CEs. So it's a lot of compliance stuff more so than it is stretching your skills. Like a lot of times, um, I guess it's not unfortunate, but a lot of people like, okay, so dental school gives you like the basic toolbox. All right. And it gives you the basic tenets that you can work within. And then when you go from there, once you get out into the real world, it's like, yes, you have to get certified to do specialist level work. Or you have to like it's advised that you you go take certain courses or at least like shadow and, and do more hands on things with someone who's qualified to to teach you the correct way, right? Um and then there are things similar to like what Tal said. Yes, there are a lot of aesthetics courses out there that you can take, but to the same extent, you still have to be willing to go out there and try it. You know what I mean? You still have to have the cases, have to have, you have to have the patience to be able to try it. And then on top of that, you have to just build the confidence on your own to be able to try it. It's a certain thing. So, you know, parameters of like, okay, a certain tooth, your philosophy may say this tooth should most likely be pulled, Right. But the patient's like, I really want to save this tooth. I really want to save this tooth. It's kind of on the borderline. And you are, you're like, okay, I have to let you know. In my in my personal uh, opinion, I don't think it's, it's the best use of your resources to try to save this tooth. But clinically, we can try to save it. You know what I mean? Like, I'm not, I, I wouldn't, if it was my tooth, I probably wouldn't go that way. I maybe just would do an extraction and an implant. But if you want to do a root canal, crown lengthening, put a crown on there hope for the best, like, or not even hope for the best, but really just understand that it may not be as viable of, of, a, of a, um, a route in terms of treatment, then let's do it, you know? So, um, but it's like, you know, that's not every case. That's not every person. Some, some ways you just have to, you know, you have to do what's right for the patient always, but, um, you know, it's just like some of those decisions you have to like pick and choose your battles, even when you do get those tools in your toolbox. So I think that's like the, the, the most interesting aspect to me. And uh, something else, as someone who's like pretty set on wanting to specialize, even not having gone to dental school yet, um, I know like a lot of people nowadays, like I feel like there's a lot of super dentists, right? Like they're trying to do everything through the power of CE courses. Do you guys feel like CE courses, like if you do enough of them in one area, let's say implants, for example, you could be as competent as uh, a perio or like an OMFS in implants? I, I believe so you could. Um, like I said, it, I think it's the toolbox thing, right? And I, I didn't mean to cut you off, Tyler. You go, but um, no, you go, you go. But like, I think it's, I think it's the whole thing about a toolbox. So you can go to school to do perio, right? You may place X amount of implants in perio. I could go do a CE in implants, and the cases that come through my office could be straightforward slam dunk cases, wide ridge nothing you know far away from any anatomy and they're easy to place so with my limited toolbox i can place a thousand implants right so the periodontist may not have a lot of people being referred to them they may have a lot of people that may not be accepting 
like a ridge augmentation implant or, um, you know, having to do a lot of other reconstructive work before they even have space to get an implant maybe. Um, and I think it's, it's also like a niche thing, right? So some a, a very complex case as a super GP even is probably something you shouldn't touch. Mm-hmm. Whereas though a periodontist or a, a oral surgeon has the tools in their toolbox to say, hey, if, no matter what the case is, I should be able to do it or I could choose to do it, right? So that's the biggest difference. So um, even if you do get the CEs, it's going to come with time and practice. Obviously, the more you do, probably the better you can get and maybe the more you'll stretch your wings to do a little, a few more complex cases. But something that's really out of your scope where you have a lot of other things to do and you probably have to do another another CE to learn about bone grafting or ridge augmentation and then gingival grafting. It's like, why wouldn't you just send it to a periodontist who does literally does that all day, every day and do what's best for the patient and have them be able to get all of that done in one setting maybe than having to come back to you for maybe three or four appointments to get the same work done. If that makes sense, so. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. First, I can really agree with Terrell. The only caveat I will add is the fact of like, when you talk about competency, keep in mind, in the if you were to ever get sued, they are going to look at you at the same level that they're looking at the oral surgeon, at the periodontist. So you better be, I, I don't know what that, that level is, but you need to be at a certain level to a point where you would not make these basic mistakes because they're going to say, a periodontist wouldn't do this. Why would you do this? Or you, you see what I'm saying? So they're going to compare you to the practice of these specialists. And if you are not as competent as these specialists um, at a basic level, then you will, uh, of course, you know, really, really get into some deep trouble. Um, but yeah, you can never, I would never, ever think that I was just as good as an endodontist. <laughs> Uh, just because I place root canals every now and then. It's just, right. it's just, it just isn't, it's just not going to be that, right? Because you have to understand in the donors, all they do is root canals every single day. If I'm doing five root canals in a week, they're doing five in a day, maybe in a morning. So they are going to be better at what they do just because they are doing it over and over and over and over and over and over and over, and over again. I think that just as a general dentist, we have to, like Terrell said, understand our limits um, and, and uh, you know, understand what cases are worth going after. Um, and I, I I kind of, you know, I tell that to all new dogs, like, hey, look, if you have that feeling in your stomach, listen to that feeling and refer out. That's what specialists are here for. You all are, you all specialists are there to, to help us with these cases. And watch this, if, even if you see a case and of course, you send it to a specialist. If you want to become the best general dentist that you can be, follow that patient, follow that case, go, go watch what happens or stay in communication with the specialist and say, you know, what did you do in this situation? If you all have a great relationship, they'll break down why this was an easy or why this was a tougher case. Um, and, and, you know, really forming that, you know, uh, that collaborative type of situation. Um, and you have to be careful with that as well, right? Because if you don't have a good relationship, you know, a specialist could, you know, down talk you or say, you know, mm-hmm. why are you doing these type of cases? You're basically taking patients from them at that point. Um, because <laughs> if you're doing, if a general dentist is doing root canals, most of the time, the patient's going to want to stay with the general dentist because they want to come back. Like they mm-hmm. only want to go to one place. They feel comfortable with the general dentist. They'll do it right there. You know, so you can easily, not easily, but you can de- definitely effectively take patients from specialists. So, um, you know, you have to really have a good relationship with the endodontist, with the oral surgeon, because of course we always want to do what's best for the patient. But as you know, Dennis, I do want us to always remember that technically by us doing these procedures, you know, if I'm getting better and better at endo, you know, not to kind of neglect the fact that I am taking patients away from my neighboring endodontist who has been doing this for 30, 40 years. That's not saying be, um, be afraid, or that's not saying to always refer. I think that's just putting things in people's mind to always do what's best for the patient. Yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, there's enough cases to send out for you not to try stuff. Like calcified yeah, canal, exactly. curve root, like skinny curve, calcified ah. canal. Like, why would you try that when you know the endodontist can do that in like an hour, most likely? You know, like it just doesn't even it, make it sense. It has the tools. We talk about the toolbox. Yeah, exactly. Like the endodontist will literally have a crazy microscope that's specifically <laughs> for this. Literally. The general dentist most likely does not have this. So, like Terrell said, or like I said earlier, do what's best for the patient. It just is what it is, you know? Simple as that, yep. Yeah, yeah. that's our thoughts on CEs, y'all. If y'all have any uh, questions, please feel free to reach out to us in the comment section below. Um, like I said, uh, you know, we're going through these CE courses, so we can definitely give you all a, a more real-time update after we've completed a couple more. Um, and, yeah, I mean, that'll be it for this week. Do y'all have anything else? No, that's going to be it, man. Thank you guys for listening to Future DDS podcast this week. Uh, if you have any comments, suggestions of CE courses for us, definitely add it down to the comments. Reach out to us. And we will see you next week on next week's episode. All right, y'all. All right, Nick. All right, Tyler. Y'all have a good night, hey. man. Guys.